Okay, let's do this. Um, so uh, thank you for joining the webinar today. I am uh, Kimball Parker. I'm the CEO of 650. Uh, for those of you who are, who are hearing about 650 for the first time, we are the technology arm of the law firm Wilson Sonsini. Now, many uh, on the call are likely Wilson Sonsini clients, but for those of you who aren't, uh, the firm has helped over 100,000 startups get off the ground, including companies like Apple and Google and Twitter and Lyft and SpaceX and Tesla, the, the, the coolest companies in the world. And w Wilson Sonsini really is one of the best law firms in the world. They are the best technology law firm in the world, uh, without a doubt. So we, we work with Wilson Sonsini to automate tricky legal issues like the one we're talking about today. So our products are like TurboTax, but with, with the best lawyers in the nation behind it. And, and the idea is to make the law more affordable and convenient so that you uh, don't have to spend your money and time on the law. You can spend it on running your business. So uh, today we're going to be talking about everybody's favorite subject, hmm. new privacy laws. Colorado passed a new privacy law, and the governor signed that law, that uh, bill into law yesterday. So this is hot off the presses. Um, and you're gonna hear from two of our privacy experts. Uh, the first is Marie Colbeth. She graduated uh, near the top of her class from one of the best law schools in the nation. She clerked for a federal uh, circuit court judge in the South uh, on the Fifth Circuit, United States Fifth Circuit. She worked in private practice and was a professor at BYU Law School and we poached Marie from BYU, and it was the best decision we ever made. It's not an exaggeration to say that Marie is one of the top privacy experts in the nation. So be prepared to be impressed. Uh, uh, you'll also be hearing from Austin Smith, just like Marie. Austin graduated near the top of his class from uh, the University of Virginia, one of the best law schools in the nation. Uh, Austin worked in private practice for one of the biggest law firms in the nation out in Washington, DC. Um, Hogan Lovells, and then has kind of uh, worked worked at some other big, important privacy law firms. Uh, we brought Austin on. Um, gosh, Austin, how long? I, th I think Austin's been with us about six months now. Gosh, and yeah, I think uh, about six or seven. Six or seven months. We're so lucky to have Austin. It was a huge hire for us, and uh, has really strengthened and reinforced our privacy practice. We are very excited. Now, this is a unique webinar in that typically when we have a webinar like this and we address an issue like the, uh, the Colorado privacy, uh, new Colorado privacy law, we have a product. So, you know, we've talked about, you know, different uh, employment or privacy laws, and we always have an automated product ready by the time we do the webinar. This is different. We don't. It just passed. We are going to be releasing products for the new Virginia and Colorado privacy law by the end of the year. So th these laws, Colorado and, uh, and Virginia, as uh, Austin and Marie will talk about, don't go into effect until 2023. So you still have some time to comply. Uh, but, and, and so anyway, we will have uh, modules ready well, uh, uh, you know, over a year in, in advance of those uh, being released. But for those of you who want to get a head start, anybody who attends this webinar, uh, uh, we'll, we, we have, a, we have an, an offer for you. If you buy, purchase and, and by um, September 1st, if you purchase either our CCPA California, uh, CCPA, the, the California Privacy Act, or the GDPR, the European Privacy Law uh, compliance set, we will give you Colorado uh, for free for six months uh, after it's passed. So, so you'll be ready with Colorado, uh, ready to go, uh, and, and we'll provide that complimentary for six months if you, um, if you purchase one of our other privacy compliance products in the next two months or so. So um, a little, little plug there. If you're interested in that or want to learn more about our, our automated privacy products, you can go to 650.com uh, slash privacy, 650.com slash privacy. We'll put that link in the chat and there you can browse around, you can uh, a request to see a demo and you can do any of that. Okay, that's it. That's all I got for the plug. I'm gonna turn the time over 
to the dynamic duo of privacy, Marie Colbeth and Austin Smith. Take it away. Thanks, Kimball. Um, Kimball already gave away the most exciting part, which is that yes, it got signed yesterday. And secondly, we have an enforcement date, which is in July of 2023. But uh, we're, as we take you through Colorado privacy today, kind of get you oriented, just want to sort of outline what we'll be doing, and then I'll hand the time over to Austin for the beginning. So basically, we're going to introduce the law, sort of describe the, the basics of it. We're going to talk about coverage, you know, what types of companies and organizations are covered by the law, what type of information is covered by the law. Um, then we'll go into consumer rights and notice, um, enforcement of the new Colorado privacy law, and then we're going to have sort of a takeaway discussion so you know top of mind which things you should really be paying attention to. And also partway through the presentation today, for those who are here for CLE, we'll be giving you a, a CLE code. And the, the follow-up paperwork for that CLE will also be sent out um, with a copy of the slide deck in the follow-up email. So Austin, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much. So um, wanted to just start a uh, level set um, and give kind of an overview of what the, uh, this Colorado Privacy Act um, applies to and who has to comply and that kind of stuff. So uh, similar to California and Virginia, um, a consumer is defined as a resident of the state, um, but unlike the CCPA and like Virginia's law, uh, there is an exception for individuals who are acting in a commercial or business context. So your employees and um, B2B uh, contacts and things will not be subject to the California Privacy Act. That is uh, the same as Virginia's. Uh, California currently has um, a partial exemption in those contexts, but it's not permanent yet. Um, so uh, kind of throughout a theme here is going to be, we're focusing on Colorado, but occasionally we'll uh, compare and contrast uh, to some of the existing US and EU laws. Uh, has a very basic uh, personal data definition, um, same as uh, Virginia, very similar to CCPA and the GDPR. Uh, it has a category for sensitive data, uh, things you'd expect like race, religion, sex life, sexual, sexual orientation, citizenship status, health, biometrics, or children under 13. Um, and there's a few specific uh, obligations in that regard to sensitive data. And there are a few exemptions uh, for what counts as personal data that we'll touch on in a second. Um, and the last thing to notice here is uh, like the CCPA, the Colorado Privacy Act has a very broad definition of what counts as a sale. It can be monetary consideration or uh, just valuable consideration. Um, Virginia is very simple in that it's just if you give data for money, that's a sale, nothing else. But Colorado, uh, like California, has uh, this broader definition that a lot of companies have been wrestling with how broad that interpretation needs to be. But uh, here we uh, just wanted to touch on some of the exceptions uh, for personal data that this law won't uh, uh, be covering. So if you have de-identified data or publicly available information or pseudonymous data with an asterisk on that last one, um, that information is not subject to all the rights and obligations that Marie is going to get into in a little bit. And just a brief uh, explanation, de-identified data is uh, information that has been completely separated from any identifying information. And as long as a company takes uh, some administrative protective uh, steps, like publicly saying they won't be re-identifying data, uh, requiring any recipients of that de-identified data to also uh, not try to re-identify it, et cetera, uh, it's considered de-identified and is not subject to the law. Again, just I, I, I know a lot of companies uh, will say, oh, well, we took the names off this or we took email addresses off this, so it's de-identified. Um, there are some more steps you need to take. It's not quite as simple as um, a very common understanding of what de-identified might be. Publicly available information is information uh, from government records um, or anything that a Coloradan has made available to the general public. Uh, this is broader than the CCPA, uh, but not quite as broad as the new California Privacy Act that will be taking effect um, in 2023, the CPRA, uh, not quite as broad as Virginia's publicly available information exception as well. 
Then pseudonymous data is like de-identified data, but you keep the uh, information separate that could re-identify the data. So you have like some random key assigned to some data and somewhere else you have a list that says, okay, this key belongs to John Smith, that one to Jane Doe. And as long as that information is kept separate and the controller, the uh, company in charge of the data can't access that information necessary to re-identify data, it's also not covered by the law. So uh, that's personal data and some of the carve outs to it. Then uh, who has to comply? Does your business or organization have to follow all these uh, requirements around personal data? And uh, it's got a few twists uh, compared to California and Virginia. Um, basically any business or organization that uh, targets Coloradans, does business in Colorado, um, is subject to the law if they either control or process uh, 100,000 Coloradans data or and this is the part that's a bit of a twist, if the organization sells any personal data at all, even if it's just you know once for $500, uh, some small list, um, and you control or process 25,000 Coloradans data, then uh, you're also subject to the law. Virginia and California um, require that uh, that second threshold is basically you have to have at least 50% of your revenue be from selling data and then at a smaller number threshold um, of consumers. The law applies. This one is any sales, um, which again is defined quite broadly. Um, if you do any of that and have 25,000 uh, Coloradans data, then you will be subject to this. Um, and then there are a few carve outs uh, that we wanted to talk about. Uh, there are a few status-based exemptions. So any organization uh, that is a financial institution uh, subject to the Graham Leach Bliley Act, and then a few kind of somewhat random categories that I assume had good lobbyists, uh, air carriers, natural securities associations, they are completely exempt from this law. There is kind of a question um, in the catch-all provision of these exceptions that says, um, uh, if you're exempted from the law, you can only use data for the purposes listed in the exemption. And there aren't purposes listed for those status-based exemptions. So a little bit confusing, hopefully some regulations might clear that up. Uh, but then there's also a very typical uh, carve out for any data, uh, not of the whole organization, but if your organization processes some data that is subject to HIPAA or the Fair Credit Reporting Act, Graham Leach Bliley, um, education, uh, any other federal or state privacy laws, basically, uh, that information itself won't be subject to uh, the Colorado Privacy Act, but any other information you have will. And a big thing to note on this carve out, Colorado uh, is very different from California and Virginia, in that nonprofit organizations are not exempt from the law. Um, if you're a nonprofit organization, you don't have to comply with California's, uh, with maybe some small exceptions or Virginia's laws, but Colorado will um, be subject, you'll be subject to it, no matter whether you're for profit or nonprofit. I think, you know, as, as we go forward and I start talking about some of the duties for, you know, the controllers and processors under this law, um, as well as the consumer rights that it's going to be affording to people. Um, I do just want to say, like, some of these things that Austin just talked about are, are pretty significant. Um, you know, thinking about the, the idea that anything regulated by COPPA is not also regulate, regulated by Colorado's law, like, that's a pretty significant difference than, than any of the other carve-outs I think we've seen so far in the state-by-state -state privacy regulations that we're starting to see. So, you know, this is in some ways really similar to the other laws that we're seeing, but, you know, some of these differences can, can end up being fairly significant depending on you know, your industry and, and what you're doing with data, what types of data you're processing. So it's gonna be really interesting, I, I think, for organizations that maybe have like one method that they sort of figured out to see what those nuanced differences are gonna be. Um, one of the big things that I appreciate about Colorado and Virginia uh, is that they're using a lot of the same language that we see in Europe's privacy regulation or GDPR. Um, you know, California was the first state in the United States to have a big privacy regulation, and they sort of started renaming things because we like to have our own names for things in the U.S. Um, but, uh, you know, we're talking about controllers again, 
So for those companies that um, own the data that are making the decisions about how the data is used, you're, you're a controller, and I'll talk in a second about processors that, that tend to be vendors who are working on behalf of the controllers. Um, but for those of you that are, are controllers of the data um, that you're collecting, the things that you need to keep in mind under the new Colorado law are that you're, you're gonna have some new duties. And some of these, again, are more reflective in some ways almost of Europe than what we've seen for example, in California. Um, so you're going to have to have purpose specification. When you collect information, you have to be collecting it for a specific purpose and you cannot use it for secondary uses. So if I say I'm collecting information for purpose A, I can't go and then say, oh, you know what else I could do with this? I could make a great marketing campaign. If marketing wasn't your um, identified purpose that you put into your notice that you give to consumers. So um, no secondary uses. So that's very reflective of what we see um, in Europe and, and in some ways we see it in California and Virginia, but it's really clearly spelled out in Colorado. Um, you also have a duty for data minimization. So um, this is again, something we're gonna start seeing come online in 2023 in California, also seeing in Virginia, which is um, keeping data for the, for the sole purpose of having data isn't gonna really fly anymore in any jurisdictions that have privacy regulations you need to say, you know, what data do we need for the purpose that we outlined? And let's not collect or let's not keep anything else. Um, so you have a duty to minimize the data that you're collecting and storing. Um, you also, I mean, this, I think we, hopefully none of us are doing anyway, um, but you have a duty to avoid, uh, avoid unlawful discrimination. Um, you know, so, so somebody's exercising their rights under this new Colorado law and you can't then discriminate against them in terms of, for example, what services you offer to them. Um, you also have a new duty, which again is, is reflective of what we see in Europe, uh, which is to conduct data protection assessments. So if you are processing sensitive data, which Austin outlined for us a minute ago, so you know data that includes information related to health, information related to sex life or sex orientation, uh, people's race, religion, other these other categories that fall into the sensitive categories, you're going to have to do a data protection assessment to determine, you know, whether you are um, taking too much risk on with this data, whether you've put in place appropriate safeguards and, and some related measures. So that's going to be fairly new for some companies. Um, you also have to perform these assessments. Um, if you're doing any targeted advertising. So that really broadens the category. A lot of companies might be able to say, that's great. We don't collect sensitive data. We avoid it like the plague. We're just doing a whole lot of marketing. Um, but if you're using targeted advertising practices, that falls into the group of um, processing activities where you're gonna have to do a DPA uh, for Colorado. So uh, keep that in mind. It, honestly, like DPAs are a great practice in general. Um, but if you haven't ever done one before, it can be, uh, it can be fairly intensive uh, to make sure that you're, you know, taking the right risk factors into put into consideration, and then you're taking the right steps to mitigate risk as you do that protection assessment. So these are sort of the the catch-all of duties for controllers. So again, this is for data that you own, that you control, that you make the decisions about. Uh, you may also be, you know, the processor of some data. So sometimes you're both the controller in some situations and the processor in others. So for example, at 650, um, you know, data that we collect, um, that we use to do our own marketing, we're the controller of that data. But data that our customers collect, because for example, um, if they're using our platform, our platform allows our customers to have a unified system for receiving data access requests and then processing them. So it's like a ticketing system. So if our customer receives a request on that platform, that data, we are processing it. We don't own it. Our customer makes the decisions about that data. So in those situations, my company becomes a processor. So it's really common for a company to be both a controller in some situations and a processor in others. And if you're a processor, you still have duties under this new California uh, data privacy law. I said California and I meant Colorado, I'm sorry. So uh, one of those duties, is that you have to enter into um, Colorado Privacy Act compliant processing agreements with the controllers of the data. Uh, you also have to provide the controllers the opportunity to object before your organization engages any sub So that's a really 
uh, unique requirement in the United States. We do see that happening in Europe uh, under the GDPR, but now your, con your controllers, so in a lot of situations, your customers um, have to be given the opportunity to object before you engage a new sub-processor. Uh, you also have a duty to assist the controllers with their CPA obligations. We see that reflected in the other privacy laws in the United States, uh, where you know if somebody who you're processing data for them they get a request that says, hey, delete my data, and you're the one processing and storing it, that um, customer of yours can then turn to you and say, we got a deletion request, we need you to delete this, and you'll have an obligation to help fulfill that requirement. Uh, so you have to help them fulfill their obligations. Uh, and then you, again, uh, have to assist with responding uh, in terms of creating technical and organizational measures. So um, if your customer says to you, like, we have to comply with the CPA in Colorado, so we need you to put measures in place where you could delete the information, where you could find the information and perform that task. So as a processor, you may have new technical things that you're going to have to implement um, because you have to be able to perform these new services for your customers in order to be compliant. Uh, so that's a, a fairly important one for processors. And then, of course, overall, what's the what's the point right what is being done with all this personal data uh, in terms of expanding rights for consumers in colorado uh, the first thing is they have the right to notice about what you're doing with their data what you're collecting why you're collecting it so that's you know really similar to every other privacy law uh, but consumers also have the right to opt out of the processing of their personal data so this is a big one it's not just the right to opt out of the sale of their data it's to opt out of the processing of their data including the processing for sale. So if your organization sells data, people can absolutely, in Colorado, opt out of that, but also to opt out of the profiling and furtherance of decisions that could produce legal or similar significant effects. So if, for example, you're an organization that um, does credit assessments, you run credit checks that you can make decisions about whether to offer financing to certain customers because you're selling them furniture or whatever it is, um, you know, that's a, that's a legal effect where it's like you have access to um, this opportunity or you don't. Um, furniture is like small, so you might be able to find some wiggle room in there, but what if you're offering mortgages? What if, you know, that's, you know, the right to housing. So um, how significant is the effect of the profiling that you're doing? So, you know, you say create a consumer profile, you're in a credit check and you say we put these two things together and we create a, an inference that is, you know, that's profiling. So um, again, people will be able to opt out of that. And um, the right, they also will be given the right to access or confirm whether you have their data. So um, again, that's a pretty general right that we see in a lot of these laws. They'll have the right to cor correct inaccurate data. Um, so again, like if you're collecting information about a consumer and, um, you know, they want to dispute the information that you have on record, um, they, they'll have the right to, to do that. Um, they have the right to deletion of their data, the right to obtain a portable copy of it. A portable copy is an interesting thing that we see more and more in privacy, the privacy space. So that would mean you have to give it to them in a way that's essentially accessible by them as the user. If you have a unique data storage platform and you were to send files in that um, data storage system, directly to somebody else and they wouldn't be able to open it without some kind of specialized program that the average consumer doesn't have. It, it's not very portable, is it? So you need to think about, you know, how are we storing data? How could we export it to an individual who asked us for a portable copy? Um, and then sort of related to this, there's a lot of rights here for consumers, but one that companies are really interested in knowing about is that they do not, under the Colorado law, have a private right of action. So if there's a violation of this privacy law, um, consumers won't be able to directly sue um, for those violations. And Austin's going to talk more uh, about enforcement and, and what that looks like in just a minute. But first, we'll talk some more about, you know, sort of the operations that come with all these new rights. And so we'll start uh, off that conversation by talking a little bit about consent from consumers. And I would just add that opt-out right um, is particularly broad in Colorado. Um, there's discussion of a universal opt-out mechanism uh, that companies will start to have to comply with in 2024 um, that kind of will give people a global 
opt out option. And uh, it's unclear what that will actually look like. The Attorney General has to come out with regulations about it, but that's definitely something to keep an eye on. So yeah, consent uh, under the Colorado Privacy Act, uh, the actual definition is not particularly unique, um, just requires affirmative act. It can't just be, you know, pausing um, or closing some box. Um, if you need to get consent, it has to be an affirmative act. And it can't be part of a huge long terms of service that contains lots of other information besides um, the information required uh, for privacy notices and things. And uh, the as a basic rule, uh, you don't need consent uh, to process uh, information generally under the Colorado Privacy Act. But uh, if you are processing any of that sensitive data, uh, which uh, again, Marie emphasized is the race, health, sexual orientation, biometric data, those kinds of things. If you're processing that, you do need to get opt-in consent first uh, from the consumer before you process that data at all. So if you collect it or use it uh, or disclose it, um, you're going to need affirmative consent from the consumer to do that. And one thing that the Colorado law is somewhat unique in is uh, talking about dark patterns. The new California uh, CCPA uh, amendments that are going into effect in 2023 also have some discussion of this, but uh, it's definitely something that we've been seeing more and more, including on the federal level. And dark patterns is a bit of a buzzword, but the general idea is um, if a user interface is kind of designed or has the effect of sort of tricking users into um, making certain decisions that are uh, less privacy protective, that's called a dark pattern. Uh, so examples are sometimes, you know, I see a pop up um, with either an ad or like you need to subscribe to our mailing list. And then in very small gray text that you can barely read against the white background, it says, oh, close this pop up or continue without subscribing. And it takes you a few seconds to be like, how do I, you know, not do this? <clears throat> That's a potential dark pattern. Um, default options um, on your website or apps or systems. Um, if default options are uh, particularly privacy, uh, invasive potentially, um, you know, you need to consider how those work and also just how easy it is it for consumers to change their decisions about privacy. Um, if it takes five clicks to get to that part of your uh, website or system uh, to opt out or something, that can be a dark pattern. So uh, it's a broad term. Uh, unfortunately, it's, you know, not completely defined um, or not very specifically defined, uh, but it's something that you're going to want to consider uh, both uh, for the Colorado Privacy Act, um, but just in general, other jurisdictions are looking at this and it's just good practice to make sure that you're not hurting all of your consumers into um, giving away all of their privacy rights. And I think uh, the key takeaway there is, uh, even though it's somewhat vague, uh, the best approach, uh, again, as far as enforcement goes, is just making sure that you're kind of uh, with the pack, uh, especially as this law first starts to get implemented. Um, if you have really egregious, hard to find privacy notices, um, and again, all of your default options, uh, don't let consumers, uh, or say you can collect and use all of the consumer's data and things like that, um, that's something you would stick out for and be an easy target for the attorney general or someone uh, to come after. So something to keep in mind and something uh, when you're designing your systems and user in interfaces to think, is this, you know, consumer friendly, easy to use. So uh, then Marie can talk a bit more uh, about some of the operational issues. Yeah, and um, before I really dive into the slide, I, I did want to bring up something that came up in the Q&A that uh, I typed an answer to that I think is relevant for everybody. Um, re regarding the idea of, I, I mentioned deletion as some of, one of the rights that consumers have now. Um, on the operational side, say if you're performing a deletion, somebody sent in a request said, please delete my information, you might be legally required to keep some information. Um, the example that the, the person gave in the Q&A was um, vehicle sale information. There's some warranty and other laws that apply where you have to keep certain things on record for a longer period of time. And in those situations, you may have exceptions where the data itself is still regulated by the law in the sense that you still have to give proper notice about what you're collecting and what you're doing with it. You know, it's still regulated by the law in the sense that if they ask you for access, you have to say, okay, this is 
you know, we do have information about you. This is what we have. Um, but you can perform if you're requested to, to delete information that you're legally required to keep. There is an exception in the law there where you can keep that information. You perform a deletion of the other information that you're not legally required to keep. And when you respond to the consumer, you inform them that that's what you did. So, so there is, you know, um, there's a lot of additional detail and nuance to how you actually perform the operational side of compliance with these new obligations. Um, yeah, Austin. And no, I was just going to say that's a very important point to keep in mind. There are exceptions for legal duties. And uh, to add kind of further wrinkles to that issue, if you're legally required to keep some information and you tell the consumer, we're not deleting this, um, but in two years, uh, that warranty information or whatever is no longer legally required uh, to be kept, then you do need to delete that. So you might need to have some system for noting hey, this person has requested we delete all their information, we're keeping this bit, um, but in two years, we are going to need to delete it. So um, it is something you're going to need to have systems in place and have thought through how you're going to handle all of that. Yeah, exactly. And some of these other things that I thought I'd note for you in the slide are similar in terms of like, you're gonna have to come up with a plan, right? So one of the things that uh, we also see in other state regulations is that consumers can authorize someone else to make a request on their behalf. So you may be receiving requests from someone other than the individual in question. So you have to have a process in place to verify them. Um, as a general rule, you have to uh, respond within 45 days to one of these requests. You can extend that by an additional 45 days if it's reasonably necessary to perform the requirements like the things that they're asking for. Um, but uh, with that, and related to the, the, my first point here, is the idea that you don't have to fulfill a request if you can't authenticate the requester. So, you know, you may need to request more information from the person submitting the request in order to authenticate them. And that may mean you need more information from the consumer, if the consumer is the one making the request. But you may, if, it's, if the consumer has designated someone else to make the request, you may need something in place to both verify that that person has truly been given that authority by the consumer, if they're a third person, and also to get more information about the consumer in order to be able to fulfill the request. So authentication um, can be layered in those sorts of situations. And that's one of the, the main things that we saw, you know, come out of California at the beginning. There wasn't a really clear way for people to, you know, be authenticated as um, being given the authority to, to make these requests on someone else's behalf. So I think we'll also see more coming out of Colorado as we see more regulations and, and things about the technicalities of how we're actually going to have this become part of the operations of the business. Uh, and, and so that sort of also will lead us into, okay, so, you know, we have all these new duties, we have, you know, a lot of operations we're putting into place. There's not really a carrot in privacy law other than being able to tell your customers, we're taking care of your data, we're making it safe, and we respect you, we're going to respect your privacy. Um, but there's definitely a stick, and that's the enforcement stick. So I'm going to let Austin talk about that for a minute. Yes, uh, everyone's favorite question, what happens if I don't do this? How big are the fines? Um, how much operational privacy related stuff can I justify to uh, the leadership of my company saying, we need to do this really. Uh, so the Colorado Privacy Act takes effect six months after Virginia's law goes into effect and six months after the significant amendments to the CCPA go into effect. Uh, so beginning of July, 2023, um, all of these obligations will be there under Colorado as well. So, um, Unlike Virginia and California, in Colorado, the Privacy Act does not itself uh, provide for fines and uh, direct uh, monetary uh, compensation. Uh, it just says that violations are a deceptive trade practice, and there are a number of deceptive trade practices in Colorado, and the general consumer protection law uh, provides for uh, how, those, uh, how fines for those violations can be meted out. So um, this is uh, bigger than California and Virginia fines. Uh, a fine for a violation can be up to $20,000 per violation. Um, again, most uh, you know garden variety violations probably won't get near that, but uh, that is a big stick um, if they find egregious or any other reason to uh, want to hit to up to $20,000 
per violation. Uh, there is a limit for $500,000 of a cap uh, in total for a related series of violations. So that might be some uh, solace, but uh, there is um, additional uh, possibilities for uh, violations regarding consumers who are elderly over 60, um, and there's not a cap for those. So if you have a product or service that uh, is marketed towards or you know has a lot of elderly people um, as customers, uh, you might want to particularly pay attention and make sure you're dotting all your I's, crossing all of your T's with regard to your Colorado obligations. As Marie mentioned before, there is no private right of action. Um, this continues California and Virginia's uh, practice of uh, not providing that. It's a big sticking point for a lot of pro-consumer privacy advocates who really want there to be a private right of action and any individual or class of indi individuals could sue if you uh, allegedly violate the law, but that is not the situation um, in any of the states that have passed privacy legislation yet. Uh, it is, uh, very relevant to note that until the beginning of 2025, there is actually a 60 day cure provision. This is something that is in the CCPA, but is uh, phasing out with the new amendments in 2023 there. But uh, if you have a violation of the law or the attorney general thinks you do, uh, the attorney general uh, or district attorney, as we'll get to in a second, um, has to give you notice that says, hey, your privacy notice uh, isn't, uh, I think, accurate or it doesn't contain all the information that it needs to, or hey, we got complaints that you're taking three months to respond to consumer requests, um, things like that. They have to give you 60 days to try to cure the violation. So if it's something that can be remedied relatively easily, uh, that might uh, be a helpful safe harbor. But uh, again, that will disappear in 2025 and, uh, the government will be able to immediately try to impose fines without advance notice. And the last thing to note here, this is actually a very important difference from California and Virginia, an interesting twist, is that uh, the Colorado Privacy Act is enforceable by the Attorney General, as in California and Virginia, but also by district attorneys. So it won't just be one office that is swamped with lots and lots of statewide issues um, doing some privacy enforcement as well. It will be the attorney general who's looking at big state law issues, but also any district attorney in the state can also uh, bring an action uh, against violators uh, to try to impose these fines. There are 22 district attorney offices in Colorado. So that's potentially a pretty big uh, addition to the regulators who could be looking at these types of things. So again, uh, with high fines in Colorado and potentially uh, more people looking at uh, potential violations and listening to complaints from consumers, this is definitely not a law to sleep on. And, and then- just, Oh, sorry, Austin. I was just gonna try in there and say, I think it's really interesting you know, in addition to having more offices that will potentially be able to enforce the law in Colorado, um, you just mentioned right there at the end, high fines. You know, when you compare these to other states, what's really interesting is there's no, um, there's no um, low bar. Like some of the other rules are like, yeah, it'll be a minimum fine of $100 for this or $1,000 for that. And Colorado just says, you know, up to $20,000 per violation. And that leaves so much room for discretion. And I, I think it'll be really interesting to see what you know the AG and the district attorneys do with that, um, because we do see a lot more interest in privacy, in concern about what happens when you know privacy and security are breached. So, so I do think potentially that that could be a, a really important shift that that we see, as opposed to these like low amounts that are sort of the standard set fines. We're not going to have those here. Absolutely. And uh, then we wanted to have a discussion now about the million dollar question, potentially now billion dollar question. Everyone wants to know what's the prognosis at the federal level? Will there be a federal privacy law? And if so, will it uh, preempt these state laws that are coming about? Um, as is so often the case in the law, the answer ultimately is 
unclear uh, when this will happen. Uh, I think you're legally required to use the term patchwork when you're talking about this situation. Um, so it's true, there's an emerging patchwork of state regulations. Um, as has been the theme here, Colorado has some twists on Virginia and California's uh, laws. So depending on your jurisdiction and depending on your uh, industry you're in, uh, you might have to comply with some, not with others, or comply with all of them. And some have some different uh, obligations that you'll need to take into consideration. The more states that do this, the bigger that patchwork uh, will be and the bigger the confusion and uh, uncertainty will be. And so that really is going to, at some point, prompt uh, action at the federal level, um, some kind of law there. The other thing I wanted to note about the state laws that uh, are now being passed with three, it's obviously not a lot, but we are starting to see some trends. And I think that will sort of set expectations of what a federal privacy law would probably look like. Obviously, this is no guarantee, but uh, the basic rights that Marie went through of access, correction, deletion, um, those are certainly going to be in a federal privacy law. We're seeing a lot of states have some form of opting out, uh, especially of sales, potentially targeted advertising, opting out or profiling. Um, it's likely that a federal uh, law would have some form of opting out too. Um, a private right of action is looking less and less likely. Um, of course, things could change, uh, but just given the that every state that successfully passed a privacy law has not had a private right of action uh, seems to indicate that is unlikely. Um, there are data minimization requirements, potentially data protection impact assessments, um, California's uh, new amendments that are going into effect in 2023 um, tell the Attorney General to create regulations or the California new privacy uh, agency, a separate state uh, agency, uh, tells them to have regulations around when a data protection impact assessment would be necessary. So uh, in all these states, there's going to be at least some of these uh, assessments necessary, reports where you're going to have to look at particularly sensitive processing that you're doing. Um, so it's a fair uh, guess that a federal law would have those things as well. So. Obviously, we don't have a, a federal privacy law that's you know, going to the president's desk yet. But uh, I think just looking at the trends we're seeing, um, it's likely that a federal law would also kind of be in that general vicinity. The other thing that is new at the federal level, uh, just in the last week or two, a new chairperson has been appointed to the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. And they do uh, some general, very high level background uh, consumer protection uh, actions around privacy, particularly um, if you say one thing in your privacy notice and then you do something completely different, that representation that you make to the public that is false can be a deceptive uh, trade practice, which the FTC can go after people for. But uh, the new chair and one of the existing Republican commissioners um, on the FTC um, have said that they are open to uh, creating new rulemaking, new federal regulations around consumer privacy. It's unclear, you know, how far that could go. Um, you know, what could they do? Uh, could they go all the way and have all of these rights and obligations that I mentioned a federal privacy law would likely have? Um, will it be challenged in the courts? Um, there's a lot of uncertainty there, but that's now a distinct possibility that the FTC will step into this space and uh, try to impose some regulations uh, more affirmatively and concretely on companies potentially give Americans certain rights with regard to their privacy. So um, that is very new in just the last week or so and something to keep an eye on. And in addition to that state patchwork creating uncertainty, the FTC um, making uh, noise about doing this, all of that is just more likely to prompt Congress to try to pass uh, federal law. There have been no shortage of bills introduced over the last few years to do this, but uh, we might be getting closer uh, to it actually happening. Yeah, and I just wanted to kind of chime in there too. And 
part of the reason is because um, at the federal level, we're also concerned with the data of people who aren't U.S. residents. Um, you know, we we saw the fact that you know we don't have an overarching privacy law really hurt us in terms of you know getting rid of the the general privacy shield that we were that a lot of companies were taking advantage of that we're using um, European data or processing European data. Um, and so if we can move towards a place where there is federal regulation, that would help a lot of companies that are engaged in international um, transactions and processing of data. So I think there's a lot of reasons that are pushing us in that direction, but like Austin has described, there's there's a lot of pushback against it as well. And I think the the private right of action is a big part of it. We've seen you know privacy legislation fail over and over again in Washington, specifically because of discussions around the private right of action. So uh, it, it is interesting, and I think we'll probably get some more patches on the quilt before we see anything at the, the federal level. Um, and then, so we did kind of want to wrap up on uh, what what's going on in Colorado to give you some, some key takeaways and answer any outstanding questions that we have in the, in the Q&A. So um, Austin, I'll let you kind of hit some of your key takeaways first, if you'd like, and I'll go sure after thing. you. Yeah, so um, definition of sale, again, is quite broad. Um, if you've been wrestling with that in California, um, you might have to start wrestling with that same issue in Colorado, um, especially in relation to opting out of sales, um, just providing personal data in return for other personal data from another company, potentially. Those sorts of things could be sales. So um, you're going to have to really look at how you're using and disclosing personal data. Uh, the coverage rules are somewhat more complex than they appear. Uh, there are those status-based exemptions. There are exemptions for particular data that's subjected uh, to the industry-specific federal privacy laws like HIPAA. Um, the enforcement issue by district attorneys, again, uh, could be significant in it just multiplies the number of offices looking at these things and listening to consumer complaints. Um, requirements about data minimization, data protection assessments, um, those are things that you're going to have to bake in to how you use personal data um, and prepare for doing any kind of sensitive processing. Um, the GDPR-like objections to subprocessors, that's going to be brand new for a lot of companies who haven't been doing business in the EU. If your vendor uses a sub-vendor, um, you now have uh, potentially the right in Colorado uh, to object to that. They ha might have to tell you who that's going to be. Um, so if you're a vendor and you employ sub-vendors, um, again, that could be something that you have to deal with uh, the controllers uh, that you work with um, being able to object to those. Um, and secondary use restrictions, um, again, thinking you have to think about how you use data and how an attorney general or district attorney would uh, look at your data um, and their uses. Um, if you say you're going to use it for one thing and start doing something new, um, you're going to have to figure out how to do that lawfully. Um, the nice exceptions uh, for companies uh, do provide some clarity so that employees and business to business situations aren't covered by this law. Um, that is a nice thing to have at least. And uh, the last thing here is the uh, exhortation to start preparing today. This is um, the third state privacy law. As we have noted, there are a lot of similarities, but um, especially in Colorado, a number of key differences. And um, even if right now you're not sure you'd be subject to the Colorado law, if you're a smaller medium business who's looking to grow, um, you might be subject to the Colorado law by 2023. And it's just kind of exponentially, potentially confusing if you have three states now that you have to comply with. Um, and it's just something that comes faster than you would expect. So it's definitely worth starting to think about these things, start planning for these things, and um, just start preparing today. Yeah, I 100% agree with, with all of that, Austin. You know, it's, it's interesting. You know, we're looking at a lot of new privacy regulation at a time when we're also undergoing a change of business practices because of results of the pandemic for a lot of companies. And one of the questions that I was asked um, earlier today um, actually sort of made me start thinking about this in terms of Colorado 
uh, you know, a lot of companies have moved to a more remote structure and have started, you know, maybe employing people in states where they didn't previously employ people. And I actually um, was looking at a report that was saying that, you know, they did a survey of, you know, like online job postings and remote postings. And, you know, after Colorado announced the new law passing, a hundred jobs within a period of like five days, a hundred jobs with remote postings had added a restriction that Colorado residents would not be eligible. Um, and, it, and it's really interesting to think about, like if you're if you're looking at a rule like this and thinking like, I don't think my company is subject to this law. You know, things like hiring somebody in a state can drastically increase your nexus, your level of connection with that state. And so there's there's a lot of operations that we might not traditionally think of as being specifically tied to privacy, where actually, you know, these new privacy concerns might really change the way that your organization responds to one of these rules in a specific state. And so, so there's a lot of things to, like a lot of uh, different things to take into account. Um, at the same time, uh, I don't think it should scare somebody away from a jurisdiction per se, because like we've been talking about, the patchwork is just gonna grow. We're gonna see more and more states adopting these rules. And if you don't have a way to respond to them now, you know, making an action plan so that you could respond is a really valuable thing to do. So if right now you're only subject to the California law and you're not planning to expand the offering of your services to other states, that's great. You know, adapt your, your privacy compliance plan to California, but think about how you could scale it. And that's one of the key things that we really try to encourage our, our customers to think about here at 650 is scaling your privacy programs because the, the patchwork will grow. Even if right now you're only in one state, you know, the goal of the majority of companies is to expand, can expand your consumer base, expand, you know, your footprint in a lot of different ways. And there's uh, one question in the Q&A that I did want to touch on. Um, the question is whether the district, att district attorney enforcement is subject to any oversight by the attorney general or whether it's totally independent, which is a great question. Um, in some enforcement regimes, um, both at the state and federal level, the kind of lower level uh, people who are enforcing uh, a law have to get approval or notify uh, the higher level uh, authority. That is not the case here in Colorado. Uh, the district attorneys can completely independently um, bring in action to enforce this law, um, as well as the attorney general can. Um, but there's actually even a slight wrinkle that um, makes it a little bit more um, menacing even in that the law does create an option for the attorney general to um, have a system where it can collect uh, consumer complaints that come to the dis district attorney and they can funnel those to the attorney general so that they can monitor the statewide situation. So um, district attorneys can independently uh, bring an action against uh, someone who's violated the law and they also can be reporting uh, complaints and things to the attorney general. Um, so there's a bit of uh, centralization there as well. So it again just kind of means that there will be more eyes on these issues. Thanks, Austin. Um, I'm just checking. It looks like we have taken care of the open questions in the Q&A. We will be sending a copy of the slide deck in the follow-up email after the presentation. Um, for those who are here for CLE credit, that email will also include the form that you need to submit for CLE credit. Uh, and we, I believe, have, have answered all the questions. So we're gonna close it up now. I did wanna make one last quick reference um, because we have been talking about changes in privacy laws uh, generally. Um, there was also a change in June in Nevada for those who are subject to um, Nevada's jurisdiction. Their privacy law that they have is, is very specific. It's regarding the sale of data um, and it's, it, regulates a very um, small category of businesses for the most part, but they did create a new category of data brokers, um, which are entities whose primary business is purchasing um, covered information about consumers, so um, covered information about Nevada consumers, um, where the, the entity making that purchase does not have a direct relationship with the consumer um, that is residing in Nevada. Um, and they're making sales of that information. So it's a very specific, very discrete category. But there's some new requirements in Nevada for companies that would fall into that category. So um, just with that, I just wanted to make that note since we were sort of giving an, an update and had a couple of minutes left. 
So um, there's another note about new changes. If you're a data broker potentially in Nevada, you have a couple of new requirements you're going to have to meet um, to comply with some transparency and disclosure requirements. So with that, thank you so much for joining us today. We really um, enjoyed the time. And like we said, you'll be receiving a follow-up email with all of the, you know, the slide deck, um, the, the Q&A, and uh, the CLE information. So thank you.